So instead of deleting this cube and making a cylinder, we're just going to press Alt X and press D and choose bisect so we can click on the Y while holding shift and click on the opposite Y while continuing to hold shift and then click on the X in order to turn this into a simple plane. And we're just going to go under add modifier and choose screw and press X in order to change the axis. We could press F to flip the normals and let's just click and apply. So for this one, we are gonna set it to eight and we'll just duplicate this off to the side and we'll make this one 16 and we'll duplicate off to the side and make this one 24 duplicate it off on the side make this one 32 and so now we have these cylinders of varying size if we press alt v and look at the wireframe they all have these nasty poles on top which I don't really care for it, so let's just select them all and add a decimate modifier to just do a planar dissolve. And they're still not destructive, but they at least look like generic blender cylinders. So from here, I'm just going to look at it from the side, select everything with one of them being my active selection. And we could just start box cutter and I'm just going to draw a box and we are going to press X twice to jump over to intersect, which I never talk about. And we just press spacebar and we perform that operation. So you see how all of these have a nasty little line in the center. We can get rid of that by just deleting the primary edge that's on all of these. We probably should have did it to begin with, but I'm just selecting them, tabbing into edit mode and just deleting the edges. So we have these cylinders of various resolutions. And now from here, we can just control A, visual geometry to mesh to make everything real. And let's press Alt X and Alt scroll to choose symmetry and let's give all of them a symmetrical line mirroring them on the Z. And from here, let's bring in our test subject, which is this cube. We want to make this cube connect with every one of these surfaces on a different resolution. I was playing with this earlier and I was like, you know, this is a pretty good example to show a couple of very basic hops tools, but also show some fundamentals of subdivision and why just life's too short to be dealing with eight. So I'm gonna shift D, duplicate this, right click to cancel, which places it here. We can select this shape and go into our mesh tools and we just choose reset axis. I'll press Y, which will set this object to this object's Y axis. We'll shift D, duplicate, and we'll do it again. Going under reset axis, pressing Y, shift D, select this one, reset axis. We wanna set this one to the Y. And so now all of these have their shapes that we're going to be dealing with today. And all the modifiers are applied to, which simplifies things. So let's first deal with this one. If we want to make life easier for ourselves, we could actually grab this edge and control B bevel it and roll an additional edge in between just to give ourselves proper boundaries, saving us from having to do that after we select both of these and give it a union. Also, our edge didn't appear to connect all the way around to the other side. Let's try that again. Let's shift N to make sure our normals are going the right way. And now we can select both of these and union them together. So with this shape, let's try solving this for subdivision. I'm going to just select these two, press J to form their connection. We use mesh machine to mirror to the other side. And you know me and dealing with subdivision, when it comes to a big end gone like this, our best bet is to select the boundaries via select loops, boundary loop, and just going under mark and pressing B to add a spacer, make sure you're in select. And now this shape is ready for a level of subdivision. So we start taking it through the levels. Let's remove auto smooth. And this is what we're looking at so far. So. We're also going to call this topo study cylinders and just save that just in case it crashes. I am using 3.0 right now. And this is basically our result. We also can add an edge in the middle, form this connection, remirror using mesh machine because old habits. And let's duplicate this and bring this up. We also want to turn off subdivision and edit mode. But let's say we wanted this to be a little bit tighter. But one thing you might have noticed me doing lately is um, just basically beveling to space things out and then forming connections around junction points that are possibly questionable. Questionable relationships with junction areas is kind of, I guess, a simple way to put it. But something like this, I consider completely experimental. And 
if we mirror that to the other side and we tab out of edit mode, we see that this isn't going to work out for us, but let's continue by also doing the same thing to this side, just kind of giving it a slightly more experimental edge flow just to try to see if we can force this to work. So we'll just mirror to the other side, grab these two and join. And this is me trying to topologically solve this area, you know, be smart with it and give it a alternative solution. And even if I tried to keep all quad rules, um, it's going to become a game of me sliding edges and moving things around in order to get control. And this is where, you know, sub D really comes off looking like a bit of a nuisance in action because this sort of control just isn't ideal whenever it comes to this. So another question I always get is why not crease? Why not use crease? Well, you know, let's, let's find out, let's select these and let's just mark them sharp. Let's select these faces, select the boundary. Let's mark them sharp. So we get something like that. And that's almost fine. We press Alt V and we turn off the wireframe. Having it subtly dip in this area just isn't going to be optimal. It just is eating away at the curvature in a terrible way. So even if we were to crease the sticks that start this whole connection, we see that we're getting something like that, which still I personally feel is not the best result. It just visually doesn't work out for me. And we can try sharpening that and we see that we're just really exponentially adding to the frustration that's going to be caused with the surface. We could try sliding things around to relax the tension, but we're also sacrificing the very form of the area itself. So we could try moving some geometry out and it really becomes a battle with these lower resolutions in order to make it work. And sometimes you can get it to, you can get it to work, but is this fight truly worth it? Is it worth it to go through all of this. I mean, that's the point of these videos is, is this worth it? Maybe it is. Um, I'm not saying it is or isn't, but just to present the question. So I can tell you right now, this is not worth it. I have things to do and I'm never going to get to lunch fighting with that, fighting with that on eight, just because I want it to work out with cat mole Mark, uh, cat mole Clark subdivision that came out like 50 years ago. No, thank you. So let's move on to the next piece. And let's also recap the normals. We're probably gonna to need to recap the normals on all of them because we start getting weird when we delete that edge. And we see that this isn't the most fluid connection, but it's gonna work and it's gonna to be to our benefit. So union, and we convert this to mesh. And because our bevel's already sullied, meaning that the settings have changed from the default, we can just bevel that, it's fine. Just a little, Perimeter protection will allow you to survive a little bit of uh, subdivision, even if you're dealing with end gons. And so, like I said, because these are almost there, we have a little bit extra control happening with our capabilities with reconstructing this area. Also, I'm not about to do that again. What am I doing? <laughs> Crazy business. So now we've actually done it on something that is 16 and we convert this to subdivision and remove auto smooth. And we see that, you know, it's a little closer. We have a little bit more control. I mean, if this is the shape that you're going for, congratulations, it's a boy, you're successful, but really we want to try to control the box shape. And so even at this resolution, while this is a little bit more optimal for our needs because we have double reinforcements happening on the edges, maybe I want, triple reinforcements and we could do something like this, but really it's starting to get a little excessive. I mean, let's grab this area and just relax it. And same thing with this, we're just deselecting our critical area and relaxing everything that's happening. And that's really not that bad. I mean, we have a big star pole kind of happening right where this thing begins and also here, but that's sub D for you. And we could still just take this, slide it in, slide it around a little bit, just to even make it more round. And then if we wanted to really relax this area, all we have to do is just slide this geometry away. So when you're dealing with subdivision at simplest form, the rules change a little bit where simplicity is almost beneficial because it feels like nerve pass whenever you're dealing with it on this level of intimacy. But for me, I'm beyond intimacy when it comes to subdivision. I just want to survive. I want to make it to the end of the goal. 
So maybe something like that is a little bit better. We've finessed it quite a bit and relaxed it and really fought for retainment. But the thing is, is we can't add any more reinforcement because this is going to change the silhouette of our cylinder. So this isn't a bad solution. So comparing at least eight to 16 or what is this? Eight to 24 to 30, uh, let's see, what was it? Eight. There's one easy way to find out. We'll grab this shape. We'll resymmetrize it and let's just grab this loop, turn around our statistics and we see that this is a 16. So we should at least label these because remembering and forgetting that's going to get old. So eight. And we also see that the wireframe for the text is showing. So we could get in and add a decimate to that of a planar. And at least then we can still look at wireframe in the lazy way that we're doing just through viewport display instead of dealing with it on a per object level. So this one is a 16. This one is a 24. Do I need to double check myself? Maybe, but I'm just going to trust myself with going with these numbers. So now let's talk about solving big 24. We looked at eight, we looked at 16 and we didn't have to go through that many iterations of 16 to get to an acceptable resolution. So let's start out recalculating our normals. Let's bevel just to help ourselves out. You know, not everything has to be a difficult solve discussion. And even though I'm using exact, exact is doing all right today in this particular moment. But tell you, you gotta keep your eye on exact. That thing will open a can of who's your daddy on you with some really crazy geo that just is crazy to solve. So this is our solution so far. And so let's transition to subdivision and we see that the top and bottoms are lost without us protecting the boundary loop. Thank you, solely bevel. And so now we're looking at 24 and 24 is actually looking so good that I'm out of here. You know, once you start adding more resolution to these round areas, you're really overriding the rules of subdivision. And that's really the um, hack that I've been using on all of these models lately is just hacking it. Like subdivision, just make it look smooth at the end, but I'm gonna overwhelm you with geometry to basically force a solution that I want instead of letting myself be at the mercy of you and your poles whenever I try to be sparse but intricate that's a little um, freestyle poetry about subdivision, but we look at these two and if we turn off wireframe, to me, I see an immense visual difference between the two as far as getting a particular result and having the least amount of distortion happening with the surface. But sometimes this is what you want. Sometimes you want that, but most of the time I want something a little bit more more controllable. I want something I could control all the way at the end using perimeter loops, but I also want something I could control at the base nice with having a loop additionally close to it that I can just raise and close via GG, everyone's best friend, to get to an acceptable solution. So now we finally get to our boy Big 32. What do you do? So with this one, we're just going to calc the normals with uh, shift in. And I'm just gonna grab this and do the same old, same old. And we see that with every solution, it gets just a little bit tighter, but it also mitigates the amount of damage. Like I should take one face of the eight, one face of each of these. And we just talk about the amount of surface distortion versus topological solving that has to be done for such a curved giant quad. And really uh, that should bring the point home as well, but all the stuff I'm talking about is Blender 101 stuff. So all of this content I feel is Blender 101 stuff. Like I'm just really re going over some fundamentals with you guys, um, especially to give new customers a chance to have a good series. What am I doing? Mirror this to the other side. Thank you, Mesh Machine. Uh oh, I might become addicted to Mesh Machine's uh, mirror. I mean, ours is still perfectly fine, but I don't know, it's still pretty good. Maybe I don't want a complex mirror in edit mode all the time. So if we take this into subdivision, we see that we're really tight 
because we're, start, we're we're with a 32 and we're right near the boundary of the edge and the solution is just crazy to me because we have so much control. So I'm gonna slide this all the way in and then press G and move it back linearly. So that way we can get something like that, which that's what I want. I want that level of control. And how much additional control do I have? Well, tons. My background just changed, causes my computer to lag sometimes. Let's control click to grab all the way to the other side. And we just slide this over and never look at subdivision and edit mode. Every time it just gets in my way, just makes me mad. You know, just, it's not a rule of Blender, just my rule. Just get subdivision out of the way. In edit mode, nah. You wanna get in there and deal with the truth of your geometry. And so while I'm relaxing the solution just by sliding things around, I'm able to get a pretty big curvature happening for these transitions whenever it comes. And we're not seeing too much dimpling with the areas of transition. So if we press Alt V and we look at our wireframe, you know, all these junction areas are always gonna result in a pull. But with subdivision, there's definitely this, this gate that I imagine in my head of how much control you can have with a pull and how bad it can be as far as uh, detrimental to the model based on the surrounding density of geometry. So this video hopefully should give some insight as to why you'll never see me really mess with eight round cylinders. I mean, I guess I would if I was using a computer built in 1983, but really in today's age, we can get away with 32 round cylinders, even higher. I mean, there's mad lads out there requesting being able to insert 128 round cylinders. So really this is child's play, but just another video, just kind of on some of the fundamental topics of subdivision and why I choose the particular circles I do. Also, 32 round cylinders are the default in box cutter. So whenever I use them all the time, I feel that I'm showing how you could use basically the default box cutter system to get to a satisfactory result.